Hi, this is James Cook of the University of Maine at Augusta, and I'm recording this video for the social networks class at UMA. When we think about social networks, we have to think about what it is that we're collecting network data for. And whenever we want to go collect data, we are essentially answering a question. We're answering a question about who it is that uh, we want to study, in what context, with what kind of relations. To do that is to set a boundary using uh, the term in social network analysis, boundary specification. Who's inside the network, who qualifies as belonging as a member of the network, and who's outside the network. Now, to make that decision is really important because uh, once you determine which nodes are involved and can relate to each other, uh, you're going to uh, get a different result than if you make a different decision. Uh, so, it's really a monumental question, and one basic division in specifying the boundary of a network, who's in, who's out, um, is between the realist position and the nominalist position. These are theoretical points of view, but they also represent strategies. And each one has a certain amount of arrogance and a certain amount of weakness to it. So, in what's called the realist position, following the, um, the, the terms of Ed Lauman um, in describing the problem, to be realist is to say, hmm, I wonder who would qualify as being in the network. Well, why don't I just ask people? So go out and ask people and trust people. When they say, these are the people that I engage in this kind of relationship with, in this circumstance, we should take them at their word. And then there's the nominalist position. Nominalist comes from name, right? So, and that is to say, oh, well, we should take some pre-existing name for something, like, say, the people who live in mm, Wiscasset, Maine, and we should use uh, classification under that name, that is, find a list of all the residents of Wiscasset, Maine, and you don't have to ask them, do you live in Wiscasset, Maine, because we know that their names are there. Uh, that nominalist position holds. So notice the difference, one in which you trust people to describe um, who belongs, and the other in which you trust some independent standard that um, meets some kind of uh, a standard set up by someone else. So, if you're a realist, you could say, you know, I noticed that nominalist position, it's trusting experts. So, the people who come up with lists of names of members, right? That could be a town clerk. Um, it could also be, if we're talking about um, categories of people, uh, it might be an academic who decides, oh, well, these people belong because we know they're members of a certain category, um, such as racial category or gender category. Um, and a, a, a realist might say to the nominalist, that's kind of arrogant, that you wouldn't just go ask people, you know, what what position do you uh, uh, belong to? Who else do you know that's in that position of being a resident of Wiscasset, Maine, or being black, or anything else like that? Being a member of a group, being important to some kind of decision. So there's the possibility of arrogance here on the part of the nominalist position. On the part of the realist position is the very real finding that often people who are uh, depending, researchers depending on the realist position, can get a lot of things wrong because people on the ground don't know everything about who's involved. As a matter of fact, they're biased in a number of ways. There's a homophily bias, H-O-M-O-P-H-I-L-Y, which says that people tend 
to be familiar with, to know about, and to know in many relations people who are like themselves. And so if we're talking about, say, a political network, you ask someone who's involved in politics in the town of Wiscasset, they're going to name people who have similar points of view. They're going to leave other people out. Um, even more damning is the possibility, given um, the study by Bernard Kilworth and Sailor, a classic study in which they ask people in a work environment who is interacting with whom, and then they have cameras set up and they're actually watching the actual interactions uh, that they see on camera are not the same as the interactions that people report. Why? Because some people keep certain interactions in their mind, perceive them to be more important, and others to be less important. And, and, and that's one possibility. There are a number of possibilities Bernard Kilworth and Saylor point out, but the strongest critique of the realist position is that there are all kinds of reasons why that we just don't know about, that someone might not tell the truth. It might be embarrassing. If you want to ask about adultery, oh my goodness, asking people to self-report could have all kinds of problems. So um, there's an arrogance that the nominalists would point out about the realists to say, you think that what people report is true? You think that people don't lie? You think that people don't construct stories in their heads even if they're not lying? And you think people don't forget? People forget all the time. The numbers of things that we don't know is huge. Um, in a study by Noah Friedkin called Horizons of Observability, uh, Noah Friedkin found that um, at a big university, um, the faculty members are familiar uh, with and are able to describe what other people do if they've done work with them. But once they go, that's a distance of one, one tie. But once you go out two ties, all bets are off. Um, people only have the vaguest idea. And beyond uh, a distance of two, that is someone who's working on an academic project with someone else who is working on uh, an academic project with uh, Professor C over here, if you go beyond that distance and further, people have no idea what's going on. They can't see what's going on in the network. So there are certain strategies that people engage in. Um, if you're a realist, there are strategies like snowball sampling, which is to say, well, let's go hunt down that path. If Professor A knows the work of Professor B very well and can characterize that relationship, well, let's go talk to Professor B and see who they know. Um, a problem with that is that it stays within that bubble of similarity, right? So who you choose at the beginning to work outward from in a network, given homophily, the tendency for people who are similar to be disproportionately likely to know one another, boy, that's, that can create problems. On the other hand, you can uh, work very hard to develop a consistent theory, which is a story about how the world works, um, that will get you some very solid, internally consistent ideas that generate mm, uh, uh, certain boundaries, like the idea that towns are important. So we would work, say, for a network within a particular town. Um, but if your theory is wrong, uh, then all you've done is really give a leg up to that particular theory. And you're going to be less likely to find uh, patterns of networks that uh, go against that theory in the first place. So what do we do with that? Well, one of the things that we do is that uh, we develop a little bit of humility about how we engage in the collection of network data, recognize that we can make mistakes, that the data that we collect is not necessarily 100% totally real in describing all the aspects of um, a social situation. But the other thing we can do is we can make sure that when we're using network analysis to study a social situation, that we use both approaches. 
Sometimes it's not feasible to use both approaches, approaches in one study, so you might have some people using a realist point of view, some people using a nominalist point of view, and then compare the results. And if you get consistency, then that's a good sign. For example, uh, imagine a, a study of uh, national legislative political power. Uh, maybe in the United States, okay? So let's draw that boundary first. It's within the United States Congress. If we're talking about the national legislature, that's the U.S. Congress. Now, from <laughs> a nominalist point of view, uh, that's really handy because the U.S. Congress has membership lists. They exist. Are you a member of the U.S. Congress? That is, are you a member of the U.S. Senate? 100 people. Are you a member of the U.S. House of Representatives? 435 people. Relatively small sets of people. Great. They're very clearly tracked. Everyone keeps track of who is and who isn't a member. At any given point of time, you can probably track it down to the day because there are House and Senate clerks who do that kind of stuff, and they keep records too. So you can track those kind of interactions. Great! So now you can study national legislative political power by studying the relationships. Maybe uh, shared voting, maybe people co-sponsoring legislation together. Sounds great, right? Problem is everything that happens in the United States Congress in terms of legislative political power simply about the interactions of members of the Senate, members of the House, or even across the bodies? No way! Right? There are players outside those formal political bodies, those nominalist boundary specifications of those memberships, right? Um, and they can really matter, some people say. Um, if you engage in a reputational approach, that is, you ask someone, perhaps a member of Congress, in this, uh, say, discussion of a trade policy, maybe you want to talk about trade policy networks, who were the most important players? They might say, oh, there was this lobbyist, or I had this constituent, or the president intervened, or, um, right, the Secretary of Transportation uh, had some Im important testimony to make, and all of a sudden you found that that boundary out there that seemed clear, let's just study the members of Congress, is not realistic because outside players matter. Um, on the other hand, they might not give you an accurate representation, right? The nominalist comes back and says to the realist, <laughs> if you ask a member of Congress who played an important part, you know who they're going to say played an important part? Constituents, members of their district, if they're a member of the House, or members of their state, residents of their state, um, who are particularly well respected if they're members of the Senate. They're not going to say, oh, was that major campaign contributor who not only gave me a $2,000 check, but also sent to my dark money group $2 million to support my re-election. That's why I'm supporting this bill. They're going to hide it. They're n or they're going to downplay it, right? So you're not going to get perhaps an accurate view of that one, of that network. Um, what do you do about this besides despair? Uh, first of all, recognize the limitations. Second of all, engage in multiple studies of the same body using different methods with different questions to generate and different approaches to generate different ways of deciding who's in and outside the network. When you do that, if you find consistent patterns, you can be more confident that the network you have obtained is a realistic representation of what's going on out there in what we call the real world, which really just means the world that is apparent to us when we use a particular network gathering strategy.